Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Architecture with Chinese Characteristics. Um, I am Dinda Elliott. I'm the Director of Programs at China Institute, and we're really delighted to um, bring this program to you today. Uh, tonight's subject is, is sort of a passion of mine and my colleagues, Aaron Nicholson, um, because we think that architecture is such an important prism through which you can look at society and where it's going and how people live. Uh, China, as you know, launched this incredible urbanization drive, committing in 2014 to convert 100 million people into urban dwellers by 2020. And they say they've done that. Um, and of course, you can see gleaming towers rising all around China. Um, but at the same time, people are wrenched from their traditional ways of life into modern city life. And so we're wondering what that all means. Um, and tonight we have some experts who have spent their lives thinking about these issues, thinking about design, thinking about urban planning. And so we're very excited to have them. Lan Dong is Professor of Urban and Regional Planning in Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning and the Associate Director for the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies at the University of Michigan. What I love about Lan Dong's work is that she's been studying housing and real estate development in both the United States and in China, so she can draw real parallels between the two. Uh, Deng's research in China examines the changing role of the state versus the development of the private market in shaping the country's housing and urban de development. And she's going to open the program by leading us through the past few decades of urbanization and urban planning policies. And then we're going to see the dramatic changes underway today under Xi Jinping. Um, we also have Shui Shan Yu who is an associate professor of architecture and affiliate associate professor of music at Northeastern University. Um, Yu's research focuses on Chinese architecture, both its history and modern architecture and its theoretical discourse, literary arts and Buddhist architecture in East Asia. Uh, he's gonna to talk tonight about how history plays a role in today's Chinese architecture uh, in the modern day. Xu Lei, then we have two practicing architects who are in China. Um, Xu Lei is the chief architect and director of the Yihe Architectural Design and Research Center of the China Architecture Design and Research Institute. Um, Xu has won many awards in China for his innovative designs, and he is going to share some of the projects, some of his projects and their significance um, in Chinese culture today. Finally, Wang Hui is the principal architect and co-founder of Urbanus Architecture and Design Inc. I'm not sure I pronounced that right. He'll correct, he'll correct me if I got it wrong. In 1999, Wang Hui co-founded Urbanus with partners, his partners Liu Xiaodu and Meng Yan, and he's overseen the operation of its Beijing office since, 19, since 2003. And uh, Wang is going to share some of his projects in China and talk about their social significance as well. So after their presentations, and they have prepared some fabulous slides, so you're really in for a treat tonight. But after their presentations, um, we're going to have a conversation. And we will also, at that point, take some questions from the audience. So please do, as, as everybody's speaking and presenting their um, their thoughts, please type your questions into the Q&A section, and we'll try to get them get to them at the end. Um, and so, Lan, is it OK? Can I turn it over to you now? Please come uh, join me. Thank you. Thank you, Dinda. Let me share my screen. Move to this slide show. One moment. Okay. So, like Dinda mentioned, I I am associate director for the Nipo Sorogo Center for Chinese Studies at, at the University of Michigan. So our Center for Chinese Studies was established in 1961. So this year we are celebrating our 60th anniversary. Just like the China Institute, so the Michigan Center for Chinese Studies is also committed to promoting a deeper understanding of China, past and the present. So we are very pleased to work with the China Institute and the American Institute of Architects to put together this evening's event. 
And this evening's program is about how architecture and urban planning practices have changed in China in recent years. And I am an urban planner and my research focuses on housing and urban policies. So I thought I should provide some policy context for the work that my architecture colleagues will present next. As we all know, China has experienced a rapid urbanization in the last four decades. China's urbanization rate was only about 18% in 1978 when the country just launched its economic reform. Today, China's urbanization rate is over 60%. And rapid urbanization has been a key driver of China's economic growth. But China's urbanization has taken place mostly through a land-centered development model. And this is how a land-centered development model works. So in China, all the urban land is state-owned and local governments are in charge of converting rural land into urban land for urban development. So what happens is that local governments often acquire rural land at a relatively low cost and then sell them for urban development at a much higher price. And the profits from these land sales have become very important funding sources to support local spending, such as funding local infrastructure development. And as you can see that because of this model, local governments in China were often highly motivated to convert agricultural land into urban development. So as to capitalize on the rising land value, one direct consequence of this land-centered development model is excessive development throughout the country, as we have seen from the creation of numerous new towns or new development zones. Some of them are famously known as ghost towns or sleeping cities. And this excessive development has not only led to the loss of agricultural land, and in many cases, it has also caused environmental degradation. As China's urbanization rate has reached a relatively high level, demand for new development has started to slow down. It is clear that this land-centered development model will not be able to sustain itself for long. And rapid urbanization in China has also brought many other challenges. And the country, for example, has been seeing a rising social economic inequality, which has been taking place in many dimensions. And perhaps the most critical social economic inequality issue in China's urbanization process is the urban and rural divide. And we know that for many years, due to the hukou system, to the resident registration system, the migrant workers in China, you know, those people who left the countryside to work in the cities. So they were often treated as a second class citizens and were excluded from many urban services, such as public education and welfare assistance. And in addition, China's urbanization has also been characterized by uneven spatial development. And this often includes the growing development gaps between the coast cities and China's vast inland regions. And of course, the development gaps between the urban and the rural areas. And so those challenges have become a threat to the country's social stability and to the government's political legitimacy. So the Chinese government has started to call for new approaches of urbanization. And this first started in 2007 when the then president Hu Jintao first announced a vision of building a harmonious society. And this vision has started to be formally incorporated into China's urbanization strategy in, 19, in 2014. In 2014, the Chinese, the Chinese State Council issued the National New Urbanization Plan 2014 to 2020. And this new urbanization plan is part of China's 13th five-year plan. I should mention that China has been China has been developing five-year plans since 1952, and those plans often laid out the country's social economic development goals and strategies for every five years. So the 2014 New Urbanization Plan stated that China needs to move away from the land-centered development model and needs to move towards people-centered urbanization approach, where improving residents' livelihood and well-being should be the focus of future urban development efforts. More specifically, so the new urbanization plan has identified the following tasks as you will see on the screen. And these tasks include promote the orderly conversion of willing and capable rural migrants into urban residents so that they would be eligible for urban services. Optimizing the pie term of urbanization to promote more balanced development and reduce regional disparities. Emphasizing the sustainability of cities by reducing resource consumption 
and promoting low impact urban development and promote urban and rural integration to reduce the development gaps between the urban and rural areas. And the issuance of a new urbanization plan is a major turning point in China's urbanization strategies. It reflects the Chinese government's intention in rebalancing urban development between social equity and economic growth and its, recogni its recognition that urban development needs to shift from speed and scale to quality and sustainability. So next, I want to mention just two areas to show how specific urban policies have changed in response to this larger shift in China's urban development goals. So the first is on housing, the housing area, which I have been studying for many years. Before the economic reform, China had a welfare public housing system where most urban households lived in public housing that was provided to them mostly for free by their employers. Those public employers include state-owned enterprises as well as government institutions. But the welfare housing system did not work well because the rent being collected often could not cover operating expenses. So for decades, the Chinese government had underinvested in housing, which led to serious housing shortage. So after China launched its economic reform, it abolished the welfare housing system and replaced it with a market housing industry, as we now say. Existing public housing units were privatized and urban households, of course, have to purchase housing from the private market. And the public housing, which used to dominate in the country's housing supply, has shrunk dramatically. By 2010, public housing only accounted for less than 10% of the housing stock. While the housing reform has significantly improved urban households' living conditions, it has also led to rapidly rising housing price in many Chinese cities. And we know that housing price has often far exceeded households' ability to pay, and housing affordability has become a major issue of concern, especially among young households who are trying to settle in the cities. It has also become a barrier to the implementation of the new urbanization plan, since a key component of the plan is to convert rural migrants into urban residents. But with the rising housing costs, it has become difficult for the rural migrants to, to live in the cities. So in response, the Chinese government has reinvigorated its public housing program. From 2011 to 2016, China built 36 million new public housing units, covering about 20% of urban residents. And the public housing stock is still growing. Unlike the old public housing units that were restricted to registered urban residents, the new public housing is also available to non-registered residents including migrant workers. And the new public housing has been used as a tool by many Chinese local governments to help attract tenants and retain skilled workers. However, even with these efforts, housing affordability remains to be a major concern in China because housing price has continued to increase at a very fast pace, especially in more recent years. So in 2016, the Chinese president Xi Jinping stated that Housing is for living, not for speculation, which has further paved the way for the Chinese government to significantly expand its efforts in regulating its housing system. And this includes the continuous development of new public housing as well as regulation of market housing transactions. So the other area I want to mention as an example is urban renewal. Since I think other speakers in this panel will also show some, some work of, of urban renewal projects. So China's urban renewal effort has picked up steam since 2012, when it was clear at that time that demand for new development has started to slow down. Urban renewal was identified as an area that could help generate new development demand and promote economic growth. Under the land center development model, many urban renewal projects were also driven by the pursuit of speed and modernization, which has often led to the massive demolition and large scale development with little consideration to the protection of local culture and history. But of course, this, however, is also changing as China continues to push for people-centered development approach. So on August 30, 2021, about two months ago, as part of China's 14th five-year plan, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural, Urban Rural Development issued a notice 
on preventing large-scale demolition and construction in urban renewal projects, which has laid out some guiding principles in China's future urban renewal projects. And as you can see from the screen, and these principles include strictly control large-scale demolition and existing buildings shall not be demolished on large scale or in a centralized manner. Strictly control large scale expansion, strictly control large scale relocation. There shall be no large scale compulsory relocation of residents. Preserve and utilize existing buildings and sustain the characteristics of the city. And this policy shift is very recent, although we do not know how it will be implemented, but there has been practices, I would say best practices that have incorporated those principles, as we will see from our other speakers' work. But I think the two areas I mentioned, housing and urban renewal, are examples of how China is readjusting its urbanization strategies in response to the challenges the country faces. Recognizing that its urbanization process is now at a different phase, it is the Chinese government's hope that by promoting a people-centered urbanization approach, it can not only help address those challenges, it may also help stimulate new domestic demand and sustain the country's economic development. Clearly, China has been looking back at its culture and history, including its socialist legacy in developing those strategies. So I will stop here and let my architecture colleagues to share their work on how architecture practices have changed in China. That's fabulous, um, Deng Lan. Thank you so much for basically, you know, for really setting the stage for this whole event. And um, it's going to be fascinating. We'll come back later to. I mean, it's it's um, it seems like this is a huge change, an enormous change in China's uh, approach to urbanization and the, <coughs> the its you know current continuing campaign to urbanize. Um, and so we'll look forward to hearing talking more about to what extent uh, policy is translating into reality on the ground. But, but before we move on to um, inviting Yu Shui Shan to talk about uh, history and how it's uh, playing a role in architecture today, I wanted again to thank the Lieberthal Rogel Center on Chinese Studies at the University of Michigan, who are co-presenting this um, program with us. Uh, they have been incredible and are always incredible partners because they have such a broad um, definition of, you know, what's interesting and what's important in China. And um, Dong Lan, I'm so uh, grateful to you for your thinking in putting this together and, and um, your help in, in reaching out to the other scholars and architects as well. Um, we're also, co I forgot to mention that we're, we're part of uh, October, which is the American Institute of Architects um, annual, uh, basically it's an October uh, annual festival of architecture activities, programs, and exhibitions all across New York City um, that takes place every, every year in, in October. So we want to thank them as well um, for helping us to spread the word and for um, helping to champion uh, this fascinating program. So, so that said, um, let's bring Yu Shui Shan, you want to join this, join us on screen and um, share with us some of um, your thoughts on history in architecture today. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and good morning for folks in China. Uh, thank you, Dinda, for you know, inviting me and providing such a great platform. Uh, thank you, Lan, for the introduction, <clears throat> uh, fabulous introduction to, um, you know, laying a great background for tonight's, tonight's discussion. And uh, um, thank you Wang Hui and Xu Lei for participating as well. And thank you, Aaron, for all the help. So, um, you know, Professor Deng's talk um, provide a urban policy context uh, for the understanding <clears throat> of tonight's discussion and topic. Um, my presentation is uh, going to, you know, provide a context of historical development in terms of how the past is driving, you know, uh, uh, urban and architectural ideas of China's contemporary practice. 
So, um, you know, when we see, um, you know, Mr. Wang and Mr. Xu, their practice, uh, you know, we have um, a good historical understanding of, you know, what were before them and uh, what wonderful work they are doing, um, quite different from uh, the previous architect and urban planners. So, <clears throat> um, you know, the planning and architecture as a pre professional practice is new in China. It started only in the late 19th century. And before that, it was just a traditional craftsmanship. And the question of how, um, you know, the past play a role in the contemporary urban and architectural practice only became a question when the collision of the two worlds happened in a meaningful way in the late 19th century. You know, there were earlier Western architecture in China, like <clears throat> early, excuse me, early missionaries had been building churches and cathedrals in major Chinese port cities, but those didn't um, bring any question about um, the uh, Chineseness of the urban, um, you know, of the built, built environment. So I'm presenting here two buildings, you know, the Forbidden City, <clears throat> representing traditional Chinese approach to architecture and then a uh, the Dongjiadu church, which was um, built in the mid 19th century. And there were, there were many uh, churches like that constructed um, as early as the 16th century in cities like Guangzhou and, uh, and Beijing as well. So <clears throat> before that, I should say, you know, China uh, encountered some uh, Western architecture, but uh, you know the Chinese um, builders had always been kind of putting some Chinese touch to it. Uh, for example, um, the famous Western building in the Old Summer Palace, which is on the lower right, um, it's a kind of a you know Chinese style bar baroque architecture designed by a missionary serving in the you know, Manchu court in the 18th century, uh, Giuseppe Castiglioni, Chinese name Lang Shining. And, uh, you know, they had, had been, you know, standing next to the Chinese style garden. And they are so minimal uh, that their impact can be um, neglected. So the eight, 18th century presence of Western architecture. And um, um, so, <clears throat> So here we have the, um, uh, during the second opium war, the, um, the summer palace was destroyed and burned. And now we have these relics. And um, so these are the, you know, earliest extant uh, Western architecture in China that start posing a question about, you know, the position of Chinese architecture in the world. Um, it is interesting that, you know, my point is in the 18th century, um, the question of modernization didn't exist. Uh, in fact, in Europe, there was a, um, a, a great interest in everything that is Chinese, uh, like the um, Chinovazri in France, uh, like this pagoda designed by uh, William Chambers, an English architect, uh, in the English garden. And then uh, it was also in the 18th century. And then in the 18th century in Beijing, there were Western style building constructed. So, um, <clears throat> so the two, you know, in the 18th century, the East and the West were kind of mutually appreciating each other as a, some kind of exotic, um, exotic, exotic fashion. And at that time, um, China um, was not facing the question about modernizing itself. It just continue its, its own building tradition and absorbing whatever uh, other style in a Chinese way. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, history playing in contemporary urbanism and practice only existed when China, you know, started to be defeated consistently since the Opium War in 1840, 
and then um, architecture as represented um, as representing the uh, European culture represent a, a civilization that had more advanced um, technology. And then the Chinese start seriously thinking about, you know, you know, how can we uh, catch up? And uh, the question of modernization started to appear. And that also um, <clears throat> coincide or maybe not so co coincidence, not such a coincidence uh, for the first group of Chinese students studying in, um, in Europe, in the United States, and also in Japan. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, Western architects also start designing uh, building in China. So um, in the 18th century and, and 17th century, Western buildings in China were not designed by professional architect, mostly, you know, just the church uh, itself, the missionary, um, just bring whatever model from their home country to, to China. So this one, um, you know, you might wonder, you know, this is, this is, is this designed by um, a Chinese architect or designed by a, a, a Western architect? It is actually designed by an American architect, Henry Murphy. Um, and um, it is quite telling that um, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, while those professionally trained Chinese architect were trying to mimic uh, Western architecture in the neoclassical style, uh, while the first Chinese style modern building were actually designed by Westerner. Henry Murphy was one of the pioneers who designed in the Chinese style. This is the first kind of a Chinese style building uh, in concrete, not in wood, um, but in, in modern material of concrete, but kind of self-consciously, self taking the imperial model uh, for a modern building. And this is the uh, Yale in China campus in, 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 in Changsha. And uh, it was uh, uh, completed in the early 1910s. Um, and you can see, so in this stage, um, they are basically taking the form of traditional imperial architecture, the big roof, the glazed tile, and try to use modern material uh, to mimic the post and lintel structure. And also the brackets, uh, dogong, were also, um, you know, sculpted in, in, in concrete. Uh, they are just a decoration, has no um, structural function whatsoever. So Henry Murphy designed a series of, you know, modern building in Chinese style. And uh, uh, he designed a lot of missionary universities, the, the university uh, uh, initiated by the uh, missionaries, mostly from the United States. So this one is, is another, um, the, the Jinling College for Women and uh, in the city of Nanjing. And you can see um, the sloping roofs and, and the traditional kind of tower. Um, so history, Chinese architectural history was used mostly in a um, kind of a formal way, uh, taking those characteristic features in traditional architecture, like the big roof, like the brackets, like the upturning eaves, etc. But the plan is entirely new. So the plan and also the composition of the roof with a central tower protruding in the middle is not Chinese at all. It is probably similar, more similar to the Independence Hall in Pennsylvania than any traditional architecture building. So basically taking those fragment uh, features and put them to dress up a modern concrete building. So um, this is another one. Uh, this is in today's famous Beijing University or Peking University. But uh, before that, the campus belonged to the Yanjing University, which is also a missionary university founded by the Americans and designed by an American architect in Chinese style. Again, the big roof, the color are very Chinese, but the way these roofs are being uh, put together is quite bozard, uh, in fact. For example, in traditional Chinese architecture, you would never 
put a, a roof like this connecting with the two symmetrical uh, additional roofs um, on the two side. So this is the kind of a first attempt uh, to combine Chinese character in modern architecture. <clears throat> so I'm going to show a slide, um, maybe speaking less because my time is limited, but I'm sure you can all see how uh, history played a role in this first generation Chinese style architecture. And interestingly, um, architect like uh, Murphy, like uh, Grass Knight, call this um, you know, Chinese Renaissance, um, you know, Chinese Renaissance uh, architecture. So um, I mentioned that um, the contemporary Chinese architect actually were designing something that is more, uh, or you know, if not more Western, at least not with so many Chinese symbols. So for example, on the left is a building designed by a Chinese architect and um, um, so it is kind of more uh, in the contemporary style of Art Deco, um, which was popular in late 19th century and early 20th century America. So, um, but uh, then some, you know, first generation Chinese architect who was a generation younger than Murphy start to pick up the idea of a Chinese Renaissance um, and started designing uh, using modern material, but adopting um, traditional roof. For example, the left building is designed by the famous Professor Liang Sicheng. And he, um, he picked up a lot of ideas uh, from Murphy, he, but he also criticized Murphy. He was mainly a historian and he tried to make the modern Chinese style architecture more accurate according to his definition, more accurate to a specific historical style. For example, this one, uh, Professor Liang was using a Liao dynasty, um, you know, Buddhist hall as a, as a model for his design. So um, same generation as Liang, um, you know, who continue the work of Murphy Liang, uh, who designed the tomb for the father of Republic, of Re Republic China, uh, Dr. Sun Yat-san, and this mausoleum, um, again, <clears throat> using the big roof as a major symbol, but um, <clears throat> adopting an entirely new plan and a new approach to spatial organization. So, um, the large picture is the, uh, the, the mausoleum for uh, Dr. Sun Yat-san, uh, designed uh, by a, a Chinese architect, uh, Lu Yanzhi. <clears throat> so um, Chinese architect Dong Dayou, still working primarily in the first half of the 20th century, and uh, then after the founding of the People's Republic of China uh, in the early 1950s, uh, some buildings were constructed, uh, continuing this Chinese Renaissance style, putting big roofs on top of multi-story um, concrete buildings. So this, these are mostly for governmental buildings for different, uh, the headquarters of ministries. The 10 great buildings uh, completed in 1959 um, combined the Chinese-ness with a different foreign model. And in this time, it was the, um, the Soviet model. Uh, some scholars call it the Stalinist classicism. So uh, featuring a tall tower in the middle, and uh, symmetrical buildings uh, framing on the two sides. But uh, the Chinese architect Zhang Bo put uh, the Chinese glazed tile roof on top of them. So again, it is the um, some of the fragmented uh, traditional features that were adopted uh, in uh, to give it a Chinese touch. So some art. Other architects were more subtle. Uh, for example, uh, this one, also one of the 10 great buildings of the late 1950s. Um, the, because of the great span, 
for the waiting room for the train station. So um, the, uh, the Chinese touch were reduced to the small pavilions located on the corners. So um, the question of how to make a modern building Chinese is always a question uh, for a Chinese architect and urban planner. Um, even for something like this, you know, on the first side, uh, the Chairman Mao Memorial in Tiananmen Square and the stele for um, the people's hero, the, the memorial for um, the martyrs basically uh, of the revolutions might look not so much Chinese. But uh, again, if you read the explanation of the design, um, you know, lengthy discussion about how the proportion and how this, how the, um, the roof of the stele um, is taken from, taken from a historical model and also the, the two layers of the roof for the Mao Memorial uh, resembles the double Eve uh, roof style of the, um, of the Forbidden City, for example. So then I would say the second stage of, um, you know, history in Chinese architectural practice came in the, you know, late 1970s and early 80s. In this stage, uh, traditional architectural symbols were not used as um, faithfully as the previous generations, but rather more fragmented. And uh, coping with the contemporary kind of postmodern fashion of playing with history. For example, this building in Beijing, those roofs were fragmented and um, uh, dissected um, and combined with a modern concrete structure. Or um, the late, the, uh, in the 1990s, the new Western station in Beijing uh, use other cultural symbols uh, than architecture. For example, the big arch represented the gate and um, using the idea of a city gate um, for the train station, uh, symbolizing train station as a welcoming gate for visitors to the capital city. So it's kind of a more um, uh, liberal way of taking tradition uh, not limited to, ar to architecture anymore in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, and this building is called the China Millennium Monument completed just at the turn of the century. And it, it didn't use any of the um, architectural, traditional architectural details, but taking, uh, you know, incorporating history in terms of the, um, you know, historical symbols. For example, here, um, it used the, the, the idea of yin and yang. Um, the outer circle represent the yin, and then the middle big sundial represent yang, and actually the giant um, middle part can rotate, um, can rotate representing, you know, the active yang versus the, um, the passive yin, and also the sundial what were also um, aimed to capture the kind of remote origin of, of Chinese culture. So history was used uh, more broadly, uh, symbols and images, not only from architecture, but from ancient artifacts and philosophical ideas were incorporated into architecture design in the late 20th century. So similarly, uh, you know, these buildings, um, I think, you know, my time is almost up, so I'm not going to eat to um, name every one of them. Upper left, use the historical symbol of the bronze tripod. And um, upper right, kind of using a abstract big roof. And then on the lower right, a uh, lower left, um, kind of using a traditional uh, big roof, but then dissected, kind of deconstructed, and using a model, a modern um, uh, kind of a, a pending structures uh, using uh, those cables. And then the lower right um, is meant to capture the image of a traditional pagoda. So, um, so 
I should say, you know, this one is designed by Amer American uh, architect I M Pei, um, and using uh, more kind of traditional artistic symbols from the folk tradition. And then um, finally, I have Wang Shu's uh, design of the Ningbo Museum. And in this case, the traditional uh, images appear on a flat two-dimensional surface. Um, you know, one might imagine a traditional roof in a Southern village. And he also uh, recycled a lot of local material, uh, tiles and bricks uh, for the construction of the walls. And in this case, you know, history was literally and physically recycled in a modern design. So um, that is my last slide. I hope this, you know, pay, pave a uh, ground for the discussion of Mr. Xu and Mr. Wang's um, design. And I should say their design uh, went beyond everything I just talked about. So they represent the cutting edge of incorporating history in contemporary architecture in China. Thank you. Thank you, Yu Shan. Fascinating. Um, and it's so interesting to think about that final building you showed us by Wang Shu, you know, is so modern. And yet the question is, what is it that makes it at the same time feel like it's Chinese? So it's fascinating. Um, I loved what you said um, that that how to make a modern building Chinese is always a topic for Chinese architects. So I think now we're gonna hear a little bit about exactly that from Xu Lei and from Wang Hui. So um, Xu Lei, thank you, over to you. Hi, good morning and good evening, everybody. Thank you, Linda, Aaron, Jiang Lan, Wang Hui, and Shui Shan, and yeah, thank you. So I will share my screen. Excuse me. I think my presentation might be a note to Mr. to Professor Deng Lan, although my the title of my presentation is Revolution versus Evolution. Actually, it's a mainly it tells story of Longfu Temple area and Wangfu Jing Street in center of Beijing. Uh, first of all, I will show a map of Royal City area of Beijing since Ming Dynasty. Uh, I think you guys are very familiar to this map. It's a uh, map. Look of uh, ancient Beijing. Uh, we can see the two right part, right spot here. The uh, Dong'an Market is now the Wangfujing area and the Longfu area. From uh, the aerial photos, we can see the Forbidden City and the Wangfujing Street. It's a more recently photo for Benin City, the Longfu and Wangfujing area. And this is a bird view from the other side. Uh, I should um, introduce some incidents during the past time in the two places. I divide the history into some part, the emperor era and decay of imperial power and blooming of capital. At the war time, it means the warlord dogfight, anti Japanese war, and war of liberation, the civil war. And then, after the new China is founded, we experience from private to state owned and great leap forward and great cultural revolution, and the natural state of reform and opening up and high development period and till nowadays. Yeah, see here is the Ming Dynasty just before as we saw. And, and at that time, this area is already a very, was a, already a very flourish <laughs> commercial area. And this function continued to nowadays. We can see from the map. To the Qing Dynasty, this is a late Qing Dynasty photos. We can see the markets before the Longfu Temple. And during uh, and the um, first decade of last century, the foreigners came in, and still here is a um, very 
before commercial area, we can see the Dongan Shichang, Dongan market here. I will show some slides here. People can see uh, the situation at that time. And during the war time, still, we, we, we can't find a lot of picture at that time, but still we can see the commercial is still, uh, still there. Uh, after the new China funded from private to state owned state, actually at that time, Shanghai in China is a very, uh, it's a very rich uh, city at that time. So the government introduced a lot of Shanghainese and Shang Shanghai's um, commercial into Beijing. And here we can see the market and uh, bookshops, something like that. And we build some theaters there. Here's a great leap forward and great cultural revolution. That time, the com commercial and the people's life are not so good. We can see uh, from the picture, it's more like political uh, activities. But even though here is also the most, uh, here are, uh, was almost still the most uh, in the most uh, flourished commercial area in Beijing and even in China. Uh, in the opening up era, and we have a 1997 state planning from the government. In that planning, there are a lot of new build commercial buildings, <coughs> but it's not carried, carried on so, so well. Here is some pictures. We can see it's not in a very good condition. And from 2000 to 2017, it's a very high development period. You can see the Dongan market, very dense and high rise building with commercials and office was built in this area and some new buildings with commercials and uh, yeah, it's uh, this area was blocked with so many big buildings. And we can, See from the Longfu area, that area is another situation. People, uh, the government didn't pay a lot of attention to that area, but uh, a spontaneous morning market developed quietly. So, uh, during, there are some big events during the training areas. We noticed that these areas were booming and decaying, but not in the same pace with that of the nations. Nowadays, China and Beijing are on the expressway way to prosperity, but here in the most central Beijing, something is not going well as it should be. Uh, we can see some broad problems we are facing in this area. First, the traffic disturbance. Second, the low reachable public space and unexpected declining spots and chaos, third chaos and of streetscape. And fourth, the lack of links between historical context and modern life. You can see the traffic disturbance in, disturb in this area. Yeah, it's the park everywhere. People have nowhere to sit. 
uh, to have a rest. And some public error is not readable. You can see the building is getting bigger and bigger and space are getting smaller and smaller. Also the chaos of street skip, you can see from this picture. The big ones and small ones, the old ones and new ones are all together. From this image, we can see the street skip in what chaos. This is a dimension analysis. Also, the, problem, the other pro problem is the lack of links between historical context and modern life. It, it, from the beginning, we can see this area is very near to the Forbidden City, but here, the historical um, context are cut down by all these big buildings. So these problems have deep reasons, such as unclear and complicated property rights, or simplified seat planning and crude execution, an ordered game between authority and capital, and the break off of tra tradition. So we have uh, we have done some research and design works, and then we are doing them now. So we want to change the like before the the big demolition or big expand expansion like before. We want to change it from revolution to evolution. We clarify the traffic system so more spaces for walking people and renovate the line spots, create open and rural neighborhood and trace existing street scape in a sustainable way, collect the chaos into order and recall the memories of history, sealed out with new. We analysis the traffic system and change some parking spot to space uh, people can can stay there and especially for for some special people like before in front of the children's theater we can see the design and we can see the pictures before and after we design. But unfortunately, although we designed it as a, um, as a public place, and nowadays they didn't find a proper um, parking plot. So the owners of the theater still parks there, some of the cars here. And in the main Pai district area in Wang Fujian Street, we set movable furniture in the middle of Wang Fujian Pai district street in order to activate outdoor place. On the left is before and on the right is after. And we also set some plants uh, like to the seeds, and it, all these furnitures are movable. Then we renovated some decline spots, created open and available neighborhood. And here is a, a little bit, a big product. It's also renovation about the Longfu mansion. We did a lot of search works before we designed. We, but we tried to uh, put the old context to the new area and we try to 
for the whole tombs inside the new buildings. Look, uh, and the upper image shows uh, uh, the alleys if before and our, our prototype. This is the new our design. And this is what is finished. Uh, this area um, is unfortunately, it caught fire during the last years for several times, but, uh, and it climbed for about 20 years after our design, it got the new life and it is, a, uh, it is called Wang Hong Spot in Beijing now. This is before the roof, and it is now the in, inside the building. This is um, the areas around this building. We reno renovated into some comfortable plaza for commercial life, and. This is treat the existing cityscape in a sustainable way, collect the chaos into order. This is a um, existing streetscapes. This is something we proposed. We here we use a big roof to collect all the small buildings together, and this. We use a new facade to collect uh, all of them. But unfortunately, these two products uh, were not um, get approved from the government. And because the memories of history, still old is new. We all know the war uh, and the small scaled buildings in tra traditional Chinese, especially in traditional Beijing, is very more important. But how to deal with uh, the big, big mast buildings? We just use some small scale uh, buildings and walls under the big, big ones. So to pe people can feel from nearby the traditional space. Here are some uh, uh, shopping areas. It's uh, something like uh, the shopping area all around China. You cannot tell this is in Beijing or in uh, such a traditional area. And uh, we did some we did some design very slightly. We just put some transparent wall into this area and make it makes the space more comfortable for people. You can see from these pictures. Yeah. So uh, for the time limited, I don't want to see a lot more, but I can see although the ups and downs in China, in Beijing, we are trying to do something to make it, make the, the city better, make, make people's life better. And the traditions, Chinese soul is what? I, I, I can not conclude here just by as roofs, Walls, uh, break something like that. I think people are trying to. Chinese people are always trying our best to get things better and keep working on it. Maybe this is part of the Chinese soul. Thank you all. That's a beautiful way to end your end your presentation. Thank you so much, Fidel. So. Uh,
I have one quick question before we move on to Wang Hui. And by the way, because this uh, content is so rich, um, mm -hmm. we're going to, you know, this program is going to go on until nine o'clock. So I hope that all of you in the audience can stick with us because there's going to be a fascinating conversation to come. But one quick question for you, Sule, is are these projects, yeah. is the point that the government basically hired you to work on these projects? I mean, who were you working for? Yeah, I, I yeah. actually we were working for the government, but uh, the government is an organizer. We have different kinds. Some of uh, them are private. Some of uh, the state-owned, uh, state-owned company. Okay, so I'm I'm kind of curious. Just one quick, quick. You said that you know one of the your your the final thing, which was the big roof to kind of unify the buildings, that was not approved by the government. So, yeah. so what, were you, were you hired by the government to do that, but then it was not approved or what, you know, what, what was it that, that happened or they ran out of money or what was the issue? Yeah, uh, just some of the leaders didn't like that. They just didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah. Well, that's government officials everywhere in the world, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's let's um, let's bring Wang Hui on to share his slides, and then um, then we can move into a conversation that was fascinating. Sulei, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Looks good. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, Let's thank you very much for- I wonder if there's a way me. to share so that it's the whole screen. Um, it's this not- This is important. not the whole screen. Is, is this the whole screen? Yeah, there you go. Perfect, perfect. Got it. Yep. Okay, all right. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, for inviting me to join this symposium. Uh, it's a very, very challenging um, topic of you know, how to keep the tennis characteristics in contemporary uh, world. Uh, because it's not only a contemporary world of China, but it's also a contemporary world of the whole world. Uh, China has the privilege of keeping its uh, continuous culture and civilization through maybe about like over 5,000 or 6,000 years uh, of the history. And uh, this is quite unique in the whole world. Um, but unfortunately today, China is under the situation of the worldly urbanization and the globalization and how to keep doing this uh, to carry over uh, the culture. And now this is a big question for Chinese architects. Uh, when we talk about China's architecture, uh, we're talking about something of similarity. Although China has a long history of architectural development, but all this kind of architecture uh, or buildings look pretty much similar. But indeed, uh, the very, I think the very, very nature of China's um, cultural development is, is creativity. Uh, for foreigners, maybe, you know, you look China's building pretty much similar, but indeed, you know, like China's uh, building has its own development, uh, is, has its own variety uh, over each generation. And uh, today, so I want to talk about, you know, like, uh, for my generation, you know, uh, on one hand, we have the privilege of uh, inheriting of this kind of cultural heritage. But on the other hand, you know, how can we carry over uh, this culture to the new culture of the whole world? Um, the first, um, the, uh, the first uh, case uh, I'm talking about is this building. Uh, this building actually stands at a very not at the very beginning of China's architecture, but at the very beginning of uh, the China's uh, cult, uh, architecture remained today. Uh, this is Tang Dynasty, and uh, there's only like three buildings remain today. Um, and this one is, is the first one. But also we should talk about uh, not only architecture, we should talk about ordinary buildings because this is the biggest number of the world. Uh, we have today. Uh, not only we have those kind of significant monumental art, um, architecture, but we also have this kind of uh, like warehouses, you know, like ordinary people's uh, residential buildings, this kind of buildings. And how can we 
put them together and to put um to make um uh, with certain kind of uh, Chinese characteristics for contemporary Chinese living. So I believe, you know, it's not things about architecture, it's not things about building, but it's things about the place and the place with certain kind of cultural art. So let's first talk about um, this building. And this building uh, in terms of history um, is in the middle of the middle ages of the European culture. And, and this one uh, was built uh, uh, in 833. So it's almost like a, in the middle of the middle uh, age and before uh, European Renaissance. And there's only like three, there are only like three buildings of the same dynasty left. Uh, one is this one, another one is this one, and this one is actually the second oldest one in, in China. And this was a picture taken during the 1950s. Uh, the building is called Five Dragon Temple. Uh, the reason for that is uh, the dragon uh, is in charge of the uh, rainwater and rainwater is very important for agriculture. And in late 1950s, we still can see the spring uh, over here, but now this pond is gone. And uh, so this is a building when I first visited in um, 2014. So it's in such a condition. Uh, why it is in such a condition? There are two reasons. One, uh, you know, the, the water is gone. And, and the secondly, you know, the agriculture uh, is no more uh, necessary to use this kind of spring water. You know, because we, right now we have those kind of um, wells, we have another irrigation <coughs> system. So uh, in terms of production, it's not necessary now, you know, for the Dragon King to broadcast the, the rainwater. We have all those kind of modernity. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, you know, means uh, to for the modern agriculture. And on the second hand, uh, there's another issue quite important to this. As this building is enlisted as a national first class historical monument, and then the government built a wall to pre, uh, pro protect it. And this wall actually is not to protect the building, but actually is kind of to uh, segregate the building from the rest part of the village. And the villagers are no more allowed for, uh, it's no more necessary for villagers to take care of the building. And then the building turned into a stage of decay. And uh, another situation is, you know, because of urbanization, so most people, you know, in the, uh, especially the male uh, in the village, they are going uh, for works in the urban area, and the only old ladies and the young children left in the village. So this is a situation in the uh, 19, uh, in the 2014, uh, just about like uh, six, seven years uh, before. Uh, ago. And uh, it's a, a coincidence that uh, in the year of 2015 of the Milan Expo, the China's biggest, or, or maybe you know, the world's biggest developer, Wang uh, they made a pavilion uh, in the Milan Expo and designed by Daniel Liberski. And after the demolition of the pavilion, they planned to sell the tile uh, designed by Libeskin. And the tile is pretty good. And uh, they want to make a crowdfunding uh, to do some kind of historical preservation things uh, for that temple. And uh, I uh, was one of the leaders uh, of this plan. And we're trying to uh, remodel um, this is not to remodel the temple, but it's to remodel this kind of preservation model. Um, so we can see the comparison between the two. Before, this is an uh, isolated temple, and uh, because of historical preservation laws, it's not allowed to do anything uh, in the in the certain area of, of this one. So the only thing we can do is to design the walls, uh, to, to design the landscape. And the way we do it is, number one, is actually the first thing is, trying to bring the people back to the temple. So we designed this kind of religious um, plaza over here to make it as a public gathering space. And of course, we have to reinforce this, this kind of preservation uh, to enclose um, the old temple 
more uh, safely. And by doing so, so we put layers, layers of the walls. And uh, from this picture, you can see these layers actually help to enrich the cultural presentation of the temple. So we can compare you know, before and after uh, for this kind of you know, villagers um, uh, plaza. And uh, then we provide a more uh, ceremonial uh, route to approach to the temple. And after get into the temple, so we made this one is more or less like a museum one. So it's not immediately you see the temple, but we provide a forum uh, for it. So this is an open plaza. And on this plaza, we have a timeline showing the development of the Chinese uh, architecture and the show uh, the position uh, and you know this kind of very respected position um, for this temple. And also on the ground, we have one-to-one -one scale uh, of the section of the temple showing all the elements, um, all these kind of uh, <clears throat> terminology, uh, terminologies of architecture for this temple. So people can read well for this one. So this is my first um, uh, image, uh, you know, for me to see this temple. So the temple is in this kind of uh, situation. And after that, um, what, what we build is something uh, of this kind of um, architectural uh, language of one point perspective and also have this kind of very, very subtle uh, race of the uh, uh, stairs, you know, approaching to the temple, showing some kind of respect. Um, so this is a very important thing. Uh, as I will mention the word of spatial justice, um, there's lots of ways, you know, like uh, to make things more justice, um, <clears throat> more justice. And one is, you know, how can we uh, pay homage to the heritage by this kind of uh, space making? And so this you can see the, uh, the SEO uh, emphasis on the temple um, and the before and after. Before, you know, they put this kind of red wall and after we, we, we made this kind of concrete panels and to mimic uh, this kind of earth uh, color and earth texture to make it more harmonious with the uh, setting. And uh, so this is before and after, uh, before and after. Uh, so this is before and after. After we have this kind of art architectural language of uh, framing, framing the view to show a more futuristic <clears throat> uh, of the building, right? And the most important thing is, is actually, you know, we should not make this one as a as space, but it should be a space with content. Uh, so uh, this is an area with lots of historical monuments, and we put uh, all this kind of information on the wall uh, and make this temple almost like a, a visitor's office or visitor center to let people know uh, the information of historical monuments over here, and then they can follow this information to visit uh, those um, sites. And also in China, um, there's only like a three and a half um, temples left from the Tang Dynasty. And the uh, Tang Dynasty is famous, buildings is famous for its you know, structure, the functional um, bracket, um, this kind of dogum. And when uh, this bracket is on, uh, in a building over here, you don't feel, you know, uh, the that kind of real uh, sensibility of this kind of uh, architectural um, craftsmanship. And we bring it down to the ground and then you can see, you know, like a, you, you have a much, much, more uh, impressive feeling of, of it. But also, you know, this is a kind of academic setting, but in the real life, it turned out to be a very, very uh, <clears throat> pleasant um, way for children to play with it, to play with the architecture. So in short, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the spatial justice um, is a key um, drive, driving issue behind this design. And uh, what, what this one is specifically for this place, I think, you know, our responsibility is how to bring the new energy, new synergy for the old one. And we try to make this one not only as a temple you know, of religion, but it should be a temple for the worldly life. Uh, so we make this one as an open museum of Chinese timber architecture. And from here, you can see the timeline you know, that people visit here. So it's almost like an open book of Chinese uh, architecture history. And uh, this kind of uh, bracket uh, courier and this kind of information showing the 
the nearby um, historical sites, all these kind of things make this one uh, more uh, lively and lively for the ordinary people so, <clears throat> uh, daily life. And uh, so this is a comparison between the uh, before and after. Uh, I just um, tell a very uh, funny uh, story about this because this is sponsored by Wanker, the developer, without any kind of uh, commercial or business um, um, ambition. They, they just want to do uh, historical preservation um, thing. And when they presented this uh, scheme uh, to the local uh, county um, leader, because this is not a rich county, and the county leader uh, respond, uh, you know, so it's more or less like uh, you give a gift to a poor uh, relative. For example, you give a refrigerator, and then you have to force the, your poor uh, cousin uh, to buy meat for the refrigerator. Uh, so, so this is a very, very funny saying. Uh, but indeed, you know, after we do this, you know, like it helps to promote the local government to input money to, um, to update um, um, <clears throat> the village. So you can see the comparison uh, of the before and after. Before, there's no any kind of cement road in the village, but now they pave this one with uh, paved cement with, um, road, and also they paint all these kind of buildings, although it's not in a good manner, a, a good style, but you know everything looks quite new. And we can compare uh, something of before and after. So, so after we have this kind of a lovely life in the village. Um, so this is, uh, that one is about historical monuments. How can we bring the old uh, into a new life? And the next one I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, ordinary building, how to convert ordinary building into a new life. So this is a um, building in Shenyang, it's a Northern city uh, in uh, Northeast uh, China, uh, Dongbei. And uh, Shenyang, uh, it used to be an uh, industrial city and uh, now you know, uh, it, the industries are gone and uh, how to make this kind of industrial area uh, into a contemporary um, um, urban, uh, in, <clears throat> into a contemporary uh, Urban. Uh, so this is a big issue of you know how to make the balance between the not only as a new building and old building, but also the new residents and the, the original one. For example, from this kind of um, Google map, you can see this is a very is a high density area, and it's impossible now to demolish uh, this area to build a new one. The only way to is to find some kind of you know like a, a logistic uh, area or a factory. Um, for all factories to make to turn convert those uh, areas into the residential or commercial development um, to make the money for the city. But um, can we uh, keep in the same idea of you know social uh, special justice? Can we take the advantage of this kind of development also to help people uh, in this kind of areas? And so that's a big issue for us, um, especially for Urbanus, uh, our company. Uh, who is trying very hard in every project to make um, the effort of this kind of social quality. And this is used to be a warehouse and nobody noticed before, you know, how good this one is because it's a enclosed, you know, a secluded uh, warehouse. But after they remove all those kind of partition walls and uh, uh, goods inside and we you know, like people just started to witness, you know, how good the building is. But unfortunately, you know, they have to demolish it and only leave like some of them you know, with the new um, uh, neighborhood. But this is a, a challenging problem, you know, how to make this one um, be harmonious with the rest part of this kind of uh, residential building. And um, uh, so that's the question. And uh, I uh, was invited to make the planning for the rest part of the lower part. And uh, my idea is actually it's quite simple because we start from this kind of things. And how can we make uh, something like this one? You know, we have this kind of old part, but we should have a new part. A new part is part of the old part, but to bring a more harmonious and uh, holistic uh, image for, for the whole. And uh, our design approach uh, starts from studying this part of the pavement and how to bring this into a new form. 
and uh, take the most advantage of very limited number of new developments, such as the gateway for the commercial uh, for the <coughs> residential area, and uh, uh, the shopping center, the uh, elementary school, and the uh, kindergarten, and make those new buildings as part of the old one, and or make the old one as part of the new one, and so we can create a, a feeling of the lower part of pretty much consistent with the same motif. So this is the kindergarten, and this is the primary uh, uh, elementary school. Because school building normally is just something, you know, like uh, because there is a very restricted uh, daylight um, uh, calculation for the school building. So there's no way to have something more uh, interesting or dynamic uh, for the layout. But what we can do is actually uh, for those kind of demolished um, <coughs> timber structure, we can put them on top of the school building and make this one as a greenhouse for children to study the vegetation. And also this is a shopping center and, and this is a entry for the uh, uh, residential area. Uh, so we use, employ this kind of um, uh, images of the old one, and not only to make it more harmonious with the old, but also uh, there's a certain kind of issue of the social um, consideration because the rest part of the buildings in this area are something like this. And then there's a sharp contrast between the not only old and new, but between the rich and the poor. So uh, the special justice actually uh, is trying to minimize this kind of social discrimination uh, in the same precinct of, of the neighborhood. Um, because, you know, like uh, uh, living is certain kind of social uh, status, right? If you live here, it means like you have much higher uh, social status. Uh, but in contrast to that, you know, how about the people living over here? Then this kind of language uh, seems like, although it's, it, it, I mean, for me, as or for other people, if they criticize me as a uh, modernist um, designer, uh, maybe this one looks um, a little bit conservative. But it's not conservative in terms of, you know, like, uh, so this language is pretty not much um, you know, with this kind of people. And also, uh, it is good for that kind of people. So in this sense, uh, this kind of language, although it looks slightly conservative, you know, but make these two uh, as a good neighbor, instead of, you know, like uh, we show some kind of more radical or, uh, you know, more or even more classical ways uh, to present those guys and make this one look um, not that uh, pleasant. And uh, also we try to take advantage of demolition and to make this one as a public um, park. And this public park is you know, like uh, we, we think, I mean, if we, if we zoom out, you see this one. So this public park actually is for the people of the rest area um, of the neighborhood, but not only for, for this one. And you can see, you know, how uh, pe people love the park and they enjoy everything over here, right? And another thing is uh, how to convert uh, this uh, old warehouse, uh, pretty big, uh, each one is about a like a, over, uh, this is like a three, uh, 30, uh, 30 meters, um, 30 meters for each unit. And this one is over like a 90 meters. Uh, 30 meter means like a, around like 100 feet, something like that. Right? And uh, how to use this one? Because this is in the Northern city and uh, the winter is very cold and uh, we try to make a new topology. So each building, uh, the first, um, glance of the building is actually it's a, a winter garden, and uh, and then the connection of this part uh, we make it an exciting space, and the structure is to mimic the structure inside. But actually, we, we try to take advantage of this kind of public resource, make it more public, and we propose this one to the local government to make this one as a marriage registration office, and the people can have their marriage and uh, uh, neighborhood uh, activities over here. And uh, also, you know, we propose this kind of new typology to enter the building. And that's why the government made this one as a public library. Um, and the, the public library is not that like uh, that kind of, you know, uh, old uh, type one. And when you enter library, you actually enter a public plaza 
and and this is a maze uh, or over here and uh, you know you can read in, in this kind of uh, public plaza so this one uh, will uh, arouse interest um, for people because right now people are mostly you know reading in kindle they're not reading books but we we use this kind of plaza to invite people to promote reading and also make the reading uh, as a reading in the very, very sacred space so reading is a uh, uh, very uh, cultural um, activity but now you know like uh, we're kind of uh, losing that kind of uh, feeling uh, so we bring back people to read in this kind of environment things like that so, and also on the other hand um, uh, on the other side uh, this one is a sales office um, for the development but we also made this one as a public venue so the first part is actually actually is a, a neighborhood center and uh, it's not allowed to go directly over here so we made this um um, we made this passage and in this passage uh, is the inspiration of the local history and then you go into the row room uh, over here also we provide uh, galleries over here so which means you know, although this is a sales office and actually the commercial activities are very limited and the most parts are all these kind of public um, venues so you enter this window garden and then uh, you go through this kind of historical um, <clears throat> inspiration passage uh, to know the history of the local area and then suddenly you enter into this huge uh, space uh, of the inspiration mm -hmm. and uh, uh, also how to creatively represent heritage is a big issue because this kind of infrastructure doesn't mean uh, meet with the uh, building code of fire protection and also uh, the structure um, code so we have to get rid of it if we want to use it, uh, you know, like uh, officially. Uh, but how to preserve it? Uh, so we invent this system of actually replacing this kind of structure member with a steel structure. So the new structure is actually is not supported by the timber, but by the new uh, steel system. But it looks exactly the same or similar as the old one. So so this is a way uh, trying to um, meet the requirement of the building code as well as to uh, take the most advantage of the visual presentation of the old one and uh, so you can see the you know how lovely uh, this structure is exposed under the daylight um, and also uh, how this one actually you know this is the old structure but this is a new structure but you know it, it doesn't look that uh, it you know like we use the color uh, to distinguish it from the old one but you know, it doesn't um, disturb the, the general feeling of the old one. And also we put this kind of new material uh, to show the, day, uh, the, the feeling of the daylight uh, of, of this kind of special effect. And we create this kind of space uh, for different kinds of public uh, activities, such as exhibition and lecturing, uh, all those kind of things. So you can see uh, the comparison between the old and, um, and the new. And also, you know, like, uh, this area is going to be demolished and uh, uh, this uh, cooling tower will be uh, away. And before that, you know, we designed, uh, we planned uh, exactly the same uh, diameter of, of this one to make this one as a, uh, a important figure uh, plaza uh, for the plaza of the, um, of the park. And, uh, you know, so we do this kind of beforehand urban memory for this, um, you know, um, demolishing, um, demolished um, part, because this is a, such a, a landmark um, for this area. Uh, so in short, you know, from this picture, uh, we can see, you know, like uh, um, there are lots of opportunities right now in China uh, for our generation to carry over uh, the old heritage to the new and uh, our, Responsibility is not only you know how to bestly actually present uh, the old one, but also how to take advantage of this kind of development to benefit uh, the whole uh, the the people in general, but not only the people for the development. Yeah, thank you so much. So fascinating. Thank you, Wang Shu, Wang, Wang Hui. So so it's now nine o'clock, but I'm going to propose that we go till nine fifteen. If people are willing to, we've still got our audience, and and there's so much to talk about. So 
So uh, first quick question for you, Wang Hui, is um, that last project, was that funded by the government? So you mentioned that the Tang Dynasty temple was uh, Vangke and I guess Wangshi, um, but uh, the, the, this last one in Shenyang, was that the government that was uh, funding that? Uh, no, actually the government on, only sells the land to the developer, right? And, uh, but uh, those buildings are listed as, it's not a historical monument, but you know, it's, it's uh, like an kind of, uh, illicit building. So yeah. you have to take some kind of measure to protect and reuse it. Yeah. And so developers sponsor uh, spons, uh, those kind of uh, renovation, yeah. but the buildings still belongs to the government. So developers kind of like rent the building, uh, okay. reuse the building, yeah. Got it. Interesting. Okay, so I'm going to ask everybody, please, uh, Yu Shui Shan and Deng Lan and um, and Xu Lei, come back on the screen. And you know, I, I'll get, I, I'll just launch. We have time for a couple of questions, so let's make them big ones. Um, you know, you've both Xu Lei and Wang Hui. You've both been talking about. It seems to me it's a lot about humanity, right? You're bringing humanity into your projects and kind of, um, you know. Wang Hui, you talked about spatial justice. And I'm really curious about, uh, you know, as China's been modernizing and, you know, racing into the future with glittering, you know, skyscrapers and everything. Uh, and yet there's, you know, the question is what role does tradition play today? And, um, you know, I, I'm curious, do you think that if spatial justice is that connected in any way to kind of traditional values, Wang Hui? So in other words, you know, can traditional Chinese values um, somehow help ensure that the process of urbanization is more sensitive and humane? So how, you know, is spatial justice, is that about kind of traditional uh, architectural approaches and traditional Confucian approaches? Or is there a philosophical connection to history? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, it's for a, all of you, but but yeah. Okay. Let, let me let me first answer your question. Okay. But it's a such a big issue. It's pretty hard to answer in several words. Um, yeah. But I want to um uh answer in this way. Number one, you know, like uh, uh we should have a certain kind of cultural uh, confidence, uh, and it's because you know China has uh, such a long history of culture civilization, but then, you know, like how can we make this kind of cultural confidence? We cannot just simply show uh, mm -hmm. our uh, next generation or the rest part of the world, you know, we have, we have already had something at hand, but the most important thing is how can we uh, take over this kind of things in our hand and then to deliver to the next generation or make the culture alive. And uh, so this is not only a culture making, but I think, you know, it's more or less like a society making because culture is nurtured by people, you know, without people, just like the first case I show, you know, without people, because those buildings, uh, that building, that temple has already been there for a thousand years. Yeah. And the reason for that is like uh, each generation of the villager, they take care of them. Yeah. But then in our generation, nobody cares about that. Uh, the, the state will take care about that, but they only make a wall to segregate um, yeah. these cultural relics, and then it turned out to be a relic. So we yeah. should not make heritage as a relic, but mm -hmm. should make it as a living thing. So that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, do the rest of you have thoughts about that? Shulei, do you have a thought about like the, the role of traditional values and the return of traditional values? Yes, I just like to, you know, I said before, yes, I think the tra traditional Chinese thoughts, I I think they were in, implanting our, in our Chinese, just like Confucius side, uh, something like um, something like we always do the self examination and uh -huh. uh, if you are a Shishi, uh, Chinese is a good learner. We learn from outside and we learn from history and we okay. learn from the mistake we have made. So, uh -huh. and 
the human things on one side, the, <clears throat> the um, space, uh, I forgot what you said, uh, yeah. the justice. The spatial justice. justice, yeah, yeah. Not only the spatial the space, the justice, all the justice. Uh -huh. we are, I think uh, we, we are the, this, this are the subject, but we are trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Although all these ups and downs, we are just trying to do that. Right, 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 right. Most uh, thing I see from the Chinese tradition. Yeah. So, Yu Shishan, in in your study of um, historical architecture, I'm sure you've spent a lot of time, and I'm sure that the practicing architects, when they were students, studied the gardens of Suzhou. And I'm really curious um, to hear from all of you. You know, do you think that the gardens? I mean, do the gardens of Suzhou and does that does that traditional approach to the traditional Chinese garden and the architecture of the garden and the relationship between man and nature and the way you know in Chinese tradition that was um, such an important an important thing. Does that still speak to you as modern architects? Is that is do, does that resonate? Is that important to you today? I think I was um, <laughs> I'm in a hotel and I think the internet just uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think. Yeah, I think you know there are certainly. Um, you know, Confucian and the Taoist idea that um, can, you know, we we still, there are some really good idea in Confucianism and Taoism, um, although, you know, how well it was um, executed in the built environment in the past is a different issue. But, uh, you know, the Confucian idea about, you um, you know, equality among people and also the central idea of Ren, and that is means loving people. And mm -hmm. uh, then the Taoist idea about, uh, you know, harmonious coexistence with nature, those can, you know, I can see um, in uh, both Xu Lei and Wang Hui's design, mm -hmm. um, you know, providing those public space and providing, incorporating nature into the building so I think there are certainly, um, you know, if we continue to do that, we are to some extent continue continuing the idea of Confucius and Lao Tzu. Um, mm -hmm. Although, you know, how well the the execute their idea in physical structure, it is a question. But it is just like the idea of democracy. You know, just a hundred years ago, women in the United States didn't have the uh, right to vote. But that idea is still very, very important. And uh, so we can certainly inherit that idea and keep expanding it to be more inclusive. I think that is uh, very important for spatial justice. And it's certainly, I think, you know, Confucius would be very happy to see that happen <laughs> today. Yeah. A question, a question for, for John Lan. I've got a weird echo. Are you guys okay in terms of the sound? Yeah. No. Okay. okay, great. Um, so, you know, the, the gov I mean, again, you were talking about this major um, change in government policy towards urbanization. I mean, and I think we in the, in the states tend to think about China's urbanization policy as being um, kind of amazing, right? The, the, you know, huge buildings and cities growing so fast and everything, but also kind of cruel in the sense that people are moved and, you know, willy nilly buildings are torn down, all this kind of stuff. So now this government change of saying we want it to, to you know, the cities to be more for people and that houses are to live in, not for speculation, all that stuff. What I'm curious about is, if, you know, if you think that sort of propaganda, the new policy is actually becoming reality, you know, is it is it real? Well, I think it is real. And I think, you know, I, I think a, a lot of things have been done. I think you also mentioned about like a, a significant number of rural migrants have become urban residents, right? I think the number is there. And I, you know, and I, you know, the development of public housing. So the, you know, the can you, can you imagine like thirty six million public housing units within five years? Yeah, a lot of efforts have been made, but of course, at the same time, there are also structural constraints in making this shift 
and I think, you know, I think that the Chinese government realized, you know, they see the problems, right? And they recognize that, you know, the social equity issue is a major challenge for the country. So they want to, you know, make this shift. But at the same time, I think the structure, one of the structure constraints is still the, the land financing model. You know, I, I think that you know, the, the China, even though you know, China wants to move away from the, the, the land center development, the fiscal model remains the same. You know, how the fiscal revenue is divided between the central government and local governments, that remains the same. So what that means that and to a very large degree, local governments still have to rely on the land sales revenue to finance a lot of their things. And yeah. so that has, you know, limited how much this shift can happen. And yeah. that's also limited by how much services they can provide to the rural migrants who have become urban residents. So that's why people have been arguing that, well, you know, for this, you know, to really implement those ambitious, you know, policies, probably fiscal reform probably will be, you know, kind of very important. And that's why I think recently we have heard the you know, Chinese government is talking about expanding the property tax reform, which would be essential, right? So, so you know, if, if, the, if the Chinese, government could start to connect these annual property tax revenues. So it certainly will reduce the reliance on this one-time non-sales revenue. So that will significantly change how urban development will take place in my view. Mm -hmm. And the um, the HUCO system, the kind of, uh, what would you call that? It's like the sort of system that, that determines where you can and can't live, right? Because you're, you're every, so, so I'm, I guess it's been changing, it's been mm -hmm. shifting, but, but that is still a challenge for migrant workers, right? In terms it's still of- still a challenge. I think it's much easier in some of the small cities and or middle-sized cities. So I think that, it, you know, it is much easier for your migrants to get urban hukou. But if, you know, if in, in large cities, I think, I think they have a limit on, what type of cities, you know, this policy could be implemented. If the cities are over a certain size, it's much more difficult for, for migrant workers to become formal residents. And, but, but I think at least, you know, even if they don't have urban hukou, they would be qualified for this new public housing. That's a fundamental shift from what was in the past. Right, 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 right. Absolutely. So I think, unfortunately, I think our time is really up. It's 9.15 now. And, and um, this has been just a fascinating conversation. And I think what you're all talking about, I mean, uh, Donglan, you're talking about it from the policy perspective. And then we've got, you know, these two architects who are actually doing this stuff on the ground, that this is a major mindset change in mindset um, in China. And you know, you guys, the architects, you're talking about a whole new approach towards society and how buildings can can create a new kind of a society. Again, it's the idea that architecture is so fundamental. It's so it tells you everything about a society in a way. So um, and uh, and you, Shui Shan, thank you so much for sharing the history. I, I think we're all very moved by the kind of humanity of the work that you're that you're all doing. So thank you so very much for joining and for um, sharing your insights. Um, again, thank you again to the University of Michigan. Thank you to the American Institute of Architects. Uh, we can't wait to get you all back again. I mean, again, you each need an hour to share um, your work and your insights. So we'll bring you back again. And uh, thank you all for joining. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.